I'm glad you stayed by. This is the meeting after lunch, and I think some of you know what that means. Uh, I'm a little at a distance from you, so it won't be that easy for me to pay attention to the glazed-over look in some of your eyes as your lasagna tries to interfere with our purpose just now. So I want to encourage you to put forth extra special effort. If necessary, correct your posture, take a few deep breaths as we launch in to God's Word. You need your frontal lobe to be engaged just now, all right? This morning, Danny asked me to share about uh, an exciting new set of Bible studies. And some of you, you said it just went by too fast. You didn't, you didn't get where they could be obtained, what it's about. Let me just briefly repeat, this is a brand new set of Bible studies, 27 Bible studies in the series called TruthLink. They are a very unique resource that I think will just absolutely blow your mind and take your heart in your relationship with Jesus to a whole new level and give you a tool to share the message with absolute biblical doctrinal integrity, simultaneously the love of God and the gospel of Christ woven into every single biblical doctrine. So get a set of these Bible studies and begin making use of them not only for your own personal spiritual growth and edification, but also to have on hand something to study with fam family and friends. So they're available at lightbearers.org, O-R-G. Lightbearers, the name of the ministry I represent, .org. You can also go to that website and just get the phone number from there and call and order them on any day of the week. All right, so I'm excited about our subject right now. And in order to access the concepts that we want to begin developing regarding the law of God in this, our final session on the subject, I want to explore with you, ask you to explore with me something that we all experience. Have you noticed that we tend to cringe when we witness pain or suffering of just about any kind? Have you noticed that? Just today, earlier, somebody was sharing with me from their heart, and they began talking about the breakdown in a relationship between a mother and a daughter. And as he was describing to me the disintegration of that relationship, I noticed that his eyes were tearing up. And as he continued describing the breakdown of the relationship, I could just feel the stab of that pain in my own heart, and I felt my eyes beginning to tear up, almost involuntarily. Just last week, a woman came to me, somebody I know, and I've known her for some time, and she walked up and rather abruptly said, Ty, my husband just informed me that he's seen another woman. And immediately, boom, the pain was there. It was residual pain for me. It wasn't even my experience. But I could, I could empathize. I could feel the pain that was throbbing in her heart. Even, even pain on what might be regarded as a lesser level is difficult for us to witness it human, as human beings. I'm driving down the road just, I don't know, a few months ago, and I'm doing, I don't know, 50, 60 miles an hour, and as I'm driving along, suddenly I see out of the corner of my eye, here comes a rabbit. And everything in me, I'm willing to risk my life and run into trees and hit mountainsides to avoid the bunny. Because everything in me is against the pain, the suffering, the death that might be inflicted on a creature of nature. Now, it is possible and often is the case that we as human beings can become jaded. We can become insensitive and insensitivity can move into being not just insensitive, but literally callous and hard and cold. 
where we can begin to hear about and witness relational breakdown and suffering and pain and it means nothing to us it doesn't we don't feel anything and then when you get past the point of just being insensitive a human being can be brought to the place where they feel no pain or empathy at all and that's called psychopathy that's when a human being gets to the place where they have no emotional response to the suffering and pain of others. Now, I bring all of this to our attention to direct you to one of what I would regard to be one of the most important biblical perspectives on the law of God, and one that I think many of us might find to be a totally new idea. We know lots of Bible verses about the law, and I would venture to say that when we turn to this one, you'll say, yeah, 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 I've read that, but almost none of us have read the second half of the verse, or at least allowed it to register. Go in this, to this verse in Romans chapter 13. Go to Romans 13, just an amazing text from which I have drawn the title of this message. Notice this text, it's about the law of God, but we're going to unpack and explore a dimension, an aspect of the law of God that is rarely ever considered, all right? This is Romans chapter 13 and verse 10. Notice the language. Love, love does no what? No harm to a neighbor Therefore, notice the grammatical flow, notice the connection. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfillment, the fulfilling of what? The law. Here, the Apostle Paul is informing us that God's law is a realm of existence, if you will, a, a, a set of parameters within which, within which there is no harm. One version says, love does no hurt to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Within the parameters of God's law, there is an absence of harm. There's an absence of hurt. Now, in our first presentation, we explored what we called the law before the law. And we essentially tried to point out that God's law is not an arbitrary set of rules that he concocted willy-nilly out of nowhere. And I pose the question to you, could God have come up with, with another 10 other than the 10 commandments? Could he have just said, you know what? Not these 10, but I'll come up with another totally different 10 move that pile of rocks twice a day, commandment number one. Commandment number two, every day look up, down, to your left, to your right, and then do it again four times. Commandment number three, those would be arbitrary commands that have no grounding in relational existence, no grounding in reality. In other words, God's law is not an arbitrary list of externally imposed rules. It is, in fact, the law of God is, in fact, a transcript of the very character of God. It is the essence of God's own identity. The law of God describes for us how God thinks and feels and behaves toward all others. It's not arbitrary. It's intrinsic to the very nature of God. Do you see what I'm saying? So this helps us to understand that the law of God is basically a description of what relational integrity looks like. The Bible uses another word to describe this, and that word is covenant. I'll leave this for you to study in your own time. Look in Scripture at the usage of the word covenant, and you will define, discover that over and over again, the Ten Commandment law of God is called a covenant. Now, a covenant 
is simply a word that describes what a relationship looks like when it's mutual. A covenant is when I live for you and you live for me. It is the perfect arrangement for all relationships. I live for you and I don't say, wow, I really like the, or you don't say, I really like the fact that he's living for me. I think I'll live for me too. This is a great arrangement. How about everybody live for me? That's not a covenant. The covenant occurs when I live for you and you reciprocate. This is what Jesus is describing. He gets to the heart of it. This is what Jesus is describing in Luke 6, 38, one of the best verses in all the Bible. This should, be, this should be something you know like your phone number or your social security number or your wife's birthday. This verse, Jesus describes the whole deal. He says, give, and it shall be given to you pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall others give into your bosom or into your life. In other words, in the process of living for others, Jesus is saying it starts a chain reaction. There's a reciprocation that occurs. There's a cause and there's an effect. You also find this principle in 1 John 4, 19, where the gospel is encapsulated in this simple statement. We love God because he first loved us. In other words, in that text, there are two usages of the word love. There's God's love that is primary and active toward me, regardless of my condition. It doesn't matter if I'm doing good, bad, or otherwise. God's love is a constant covenantal faithfulness to me. The Bible says in another place that if we are unfaithful, God is or remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. In other words, God cannot go contrary to who he is. He can't be other than what he is. And what is he? He's faithful, whether I am or not. Whether I am or not. And that faithful love then initiates a response in me. One author says love begets love. In other words, God's love is a creative force. It produces after its own kind. And so, the Apostle Paul says, love does no harm to its neighbor. In other words, there is an absence of relational violation where love is occurring. Love is not a silly, sentimental, cotton candy, sweet kind of sentimentalism. It's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is a powerful principle. It is a force to be reckoned with. And the force to be reckoned with in the love of God is that he will be good and faithful to you and me no matter what we do to him. And that's why we see God's love reaching its pinnacle expression at Calvary. John chapter 13, verse 1, as Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry, this is such a powerful line. He's coming to the end of his ministry. He's about to wash the disciples' feet. He's about to celebrate the Passover with them. He's about to go to Calvary. And John 13, 1 says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. That is to say, he loved them to the end of himself. When Jesus died at the cross, Jesus perfected, personified, revealed, and put on living display the love of God in its most beautiful possible expression. He loved all others above and before himself, and he wasn't feeling super sentimentally or emotionally high while he was hanging on the cross. He was experiencing excruciating pain and the pain of self-denial to keep loving, loving, loving you and me above himself to the nth degree of self-sacrifice. That's what love looks like in action. Now, for you and me, for you and me, God envelops us with this love, again, to quote an author 
that really gets this. We're surrounded with an atmosphere of grace, the whole human race. We're surrounded with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air we breathe. In other words, whether you turn to the left or to the right, up or down, any direction you look within the parameters of the gospel, you realize that to use the language of John in John chapter 1, God has heaped upon us grace upon grace. He's always good no matter what, and the only question is, do we see it? And once we see it and it really rivets our attention, we begin to voluntarily, of our own free will, spontaneously, we begin to return to Him from the inside out. It's not merely an outward demand or compliance that God's looking for. He's not looking for robots or machines or slaves. He's looking for living, volitional, emotional, rational friends. He's looking for people who will know Him in the interior of His heart and like what they see and reciprocate and love Him back. So here we have Paul telling us, do you want to know what the law is all about, Paul says? It's about no harm. It's about relational integrity. When a man comes to me and he says... I just can't sustain this marriage. I'm going to leave. I don't love her anymore. I don't love her anymore. What he's describing is the breakdown of what the Bible calls love. Relational disintegration is occurring. And essentially what he's saying is that he refuses to continue to keep his vow. He refuses to be faithful. When the Bible says God is love, it doesn't simply mean that God has warm sentimental feelings toward you. It means God is faithful to you. God will follow through. If you want to summarize the whole Bible, the whole, here, here it is. Here's, here's the Bible. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here it is. The Old Testament is a promise made and the New Testament is a promise kept. That's what it is. That's why it's called the Old Testament covenant or testament, and the new covenant. It's God saying, I love you, I'll keep loving you, and I will give my son. And the whole Old Testament is one messianic prophecy after another. Jesus is coming. I will give him as a covenant to the people, the Old Testament says. Jesus will come and he will fulfill the covenant. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he will be cut off. He will go to Calvary to ratify relational faithfulness. That's Daniel chapter 9. So the whole Bible is God saying, I love you, and I'll prove it. And the New Testament is in Jesus Christ, God proving it. God following through to keep covenant with you and me, regardless of our unfaithfulness. The love of God is nothing less than relational faithfulness. It is faithfulness at any cost to one's self. And so this no harm idea, let's unpack it further. What in the world does Paul mean when he says there's no harm done when love is being exercised? When love is in play, there's no harm. That means that in any given relationship, I am, you are, God is, whoever the participants are. In any given relationship, the individuals are choosing what is best and right for the other, for the other, first and foremost, above self. So there's, there's no violation occurring. Now, God has chosen to create human beings to operate in precisely this manner. I want you to look with me at Genesis real quick. We're going we're gonna to do a little tour de force here of the Bible, and we're going to begin at the beginning with Genesis. I want you to notice something here, a pattern in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. For the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you some things you already know and then focus on some parts that we need to have really emphasized for us and brought to our attention. Each day of creation, watch this, 
God comes to the end of that particular segment of what he made, and he says, it's good, right? You know this part. It's good. Comes to the end of the second day, he looks at everything he made, and he says, it's good. Third day, it's good. Fourth day, it's good. Fifth day, good. Into the sixth day, God says something. He modifies his declaration. He says, he says behold, now it is very good. Now, the difference between good and very good in the development of the narrative is that good is descriptive of the constituent parts of creation under development. In other words, good for what it is on that day, at that level, at that stage of the creation venture, okay? The difference between good and good, good and very good is creation in process, yep, that's good, 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 and creation complete. Now, what makes creation complete? The creation of the man and the woman on the latter part of the sixth day. Once the man and the woman are created, they are placed, as it were, in this incredible material environment that surrounds them. And it says in chapter 2 that God put them in a garden. And God actually gave the garden a name. He gave the garden a name. He said the garden that he put them in would be called, chapter 2, verse 8, Eden. Now, Develop this with me. When we read the word Eden, we think, oh, that's just the name that God came up with for the garden. And it is the name that God came up with. But it's not just, it's not just a collection of letters to create a certain phonetic sound. Every name in the Bible means something. It all has definition, whether it's the name of a person or it's the name of a place. Every, every place and thing and person is named according to its function, according to its intrinsic value, what it's for, what it does. The word Eden isn't just a nice name to refer to a place. It literally has a meaning. Eden is the Hebrew word for pleasure, so literally, here's what we see taking place. God creates this incredible material environment, okay? He creates landscapes. He creates a profusion of colors from the flowers and the trees and the skyline. He creates flowing brooks with gent gentle water that, that fills the ear. He fills the sky with birds and he says, you know what? Not only are these going to be visually beautiful, I'm going to make them sing. And so God creates birds that sing. They fill the earth. They fill the sky with their, their visual beauty and the beauty of the song that they sing. God surrounds the man and the woman with what? With beauty of every kind. He says, and I'm going to create tasty stuff for you to eat. So he creates various different trees that bear fruit. They're not all the same. They're different. This one tastes like that and the other like something else. And these flavors are engineered by God to just dance all over their taste buds so that with every bite, there's delight. This is all intentional. This is telling us something about the character of God. God could have said, I'm going to create the man and the woman and I'm going to have one tree and it's going to have a tube hanging from it, and every day for one hour I'll have them hook up to an IV machine and get some nourishment. He could have said, no, I'll have one tree, and it'll be, the fruit will be brown in color, and it will taste like cardboard. No. God, out of the beauty and abundance of his creativity, says, I'm going to create lots of different trees, and man, oh man, they're going to taste good. They're going to love this stuff. This is the kind of God we're dealing with. He surrounds them with visual beauty, auditory beauty, flavors. He creates them and puts them in the garden of pleasure. The garden of pleasure. Now, here we are post-fall in the world in which we live, 
And it's natural for us as believers in Christ to sometimes have a negative view of the word or the concept of pleasure. But biblically speaking, pleasure is the invention of Almighty God. God is the author of pleasure. God is the one who created the human machine, if you will, this thing that we are, to intellectually enjoy the process of problem solving, to scientifically investigate the mysteries of the universe and just be delighted to discover new things. God's the one that created the emotional component in the human being, to, to walk up and to develop a relationship with somebody and have them look back into your eyes and you get the feeling that, wow, I like you and you like me. And that feeling of emotional satisfaction. God's the author of that. God's the one who created the body with its ability to feel pleasure. God's the one who said, not only am I going to create a man, I'm going to create a man and a woman, and I'm going, to, I'm going to let them fall in love and enjoy one another's friendship. God's the author of all of this. Now, having created this kind of environment, this kind of world, this kind of this garden of pleasure, God put the man and the woman there, and he basically said, hey, have a great time. Be fruitful, multiply, and expand the garden to encompass the whole earth. Steward all of this beauty in such a way that the garden of pleasure grows to take in the whole planet. And multiply, procreate all kinds of other human beings who themselves will join in all the fun of existence. This is God. Now, having created that kind of environment and that kind of world, sin enters the picture in chapter 3. But I want you to notice now a contrast because this is the first time that we encounter the principle of God's law and what sin is by contrast. Again, this is the first time we encounter in Scripture the principle of God's law. I say the principle of God's law because we don't find in Genesis 1 and 2 the Ten Commandments. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. We don't find that in Genesis 1 and 2. But we find the essence of the law in Genesis 1 and 2 in that God created the man and the woman to live in relational integrity. Each one living wholly for the other and both of them living for God and God living for them. That's the law of God, in essence. It's right there in principle. Now, God did something very interesting when he created this environment. Chapter 2, notice carefully verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, notice the language, of every tree of the garden. What are the next three words? You may freely. You may may, you may, you may freely eat. Okay, grammatically, as God is speaking, he is formulating a positive grammatical structure. He's telling them what they may do, and it's a vast horizon of freedom. He says, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but then notice verse 17, but qualification, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Notice this. God presents a huge, a vast horizon of liberty and freedom. Of every tree you may freely eat, but not this one. And the one qualification embedded in God's language is a protective language because I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to die. Now, two things we need to see here from the get-go. Number one, the scripture does not say, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but not this one because if you do, I'll kill you. It doesn't say, don't 
eat of that one or I'll kill you. It's not don't or I'll kill you, it's don't or you'll die. God is describing the nature of reality as God created reality to function. He's describing a state of affairs in which relational breakdown, relational violation causes pain and hurt and disintegration. He's not giving a threat. He's describing the cause and effect relationship that is involved in either love or selfishness. It's very interesting, though, because when the devil comes to tempt the man and the woman, beginning with the woman, notice chapter 3, verse 1, and you will immediately, this is just going to click on, the lights are going to come shining. If your lasagna can get out of the way, you're about to realize something very profound. Notice chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning. Notice cunning. Another version says subtle. He's coming with an intent to what? To deceive. He's not coming with truth. He's coming with a skewed view of things. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, and what are you going to expect out of this guy's mouth? Some kind of, some kind of tweak, some kind of, mm. he's going to twist it. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Do you hear the difference? Do you catch the subtlety? Notice that God presented the matter as big freedom, minor restriction for your good. The devil comes along and he flips it and he presents vast restriction. And he doesn't even mention any freedom. He essentially says, has God told you you can't eat of everything? He's trying to arouse in humanity a sense of restriction. You can't. Notice if you compare verse 16 of chapter 2, underline or circle if you do that in your Bible or take notes. God says, you may. Circle the words, you may. The devil down in chapter 3, verse 1 says, you shall not. This is the difference between the biblical true view of God's law and the demonic tweaking of God's law. God is not a God of, he's not primarily, he is not fundamentally a God of restriction. He's a God of pleasure and liberty. In fact, the New Testament calls God's law a perfect law of liberty. It's all about freedom. It's not about restriction. And the only thing that God ever forbids is that which would hurt us that which would bring harm, that which would break down the quality of our lives and our capacity for pleasure and enjoyment in life. Look now with me, if you don't mind, go quickly over to Deuteronomy chapter 5. And notice how God frames his law in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. You're going to love this. This is just so important to understand when we're dealing with the law of God. And that's what this five-part series is about. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. This should be foremost in our notes regarding the law of God. And this is in quote marks. In my, I'm using the New King James Version. So, so Moses is literally quoting the Lord. This is God talking directly. And God says, verse 29, Oh, that they had such a what? Such a heart in them that they would fear me, that is, with awe, reverence, and really understand who I am to them, that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, comma. And what follows is brilliant. God doesn't say, oh, that they would always keep my commandments because I'm God and they're not, and by golly, they better do what I say. It's not God framing our existence in terms of restriction for restriction's sake. Do you hear my words? 
He's not restrictive for restrictions sake. No. Here God is saying, oh, I wish that they had a heart in them that would keep all my commandments. Not because I'm a micromanaging control freak. Do you see the words after the comma? That it might be well with them and with their children forever. What is God describing here? God is saying, oh, how I wish that they had a heart in them. Not just behavioral compliance. Where is God trying to get? Into our hearts. Oh, that they had a heart in them to keep all my commandments. Why? What's God's motive? So that things would go really well for them and for their children forever. In other words, God is describing in the word forever the only way that life is ultimately sustainable with joy and pleasure and happiness. Within the parameters of God's law, there is vast freedom. Let me give a simple example. Our popular culture is obsessed with sexuality, if you haven't noticed. Billboards, magazines, television shows, music. We live in a society that is just saturated with smutty sexuality. Now watch this. The impression that's out there is that God's ways with regards to sexuality are restrictive. God says, you shall not commit adultery. And the world tilts their head and crosses their arms and says, wow, that is so narrow-minded. Is God a party pooper or what? But here's the truth of the matter. Listen to this. When God says, here are the parameters for sexuality, right? Do you know what he's actually doing? He's describing the parameters within which great freedom can occur. Because within a monogamous relationship for life between one man and one woman, watch this. Here's what happens. When a man and a woman mutually commit to one another, they'll have some hard times. After all, we're sinners. We're messed up from the word go. Look in the mirror, you're dysfunctional. The fact is that if God were to back up one little baby step from you and me, you would lose it and so would I. We are one step away from insanity at any given moment, but for the grace of God, there go I, there go you. But when two people come together and they make a commitment, here's what happens. The commitment itself, that is the relational faithfulness, that's what we're talking about here, that commitment itself will be tried but if they continue to be committed to one another and at the point of stress don't give up, there are levels of trust and security right around the corner that would never be possible if you throw in the towel at the two-year point or the three-year point or the seven-year point where you just can't stand him anymore. Well, if you keep working through it, and there are exceptions of abuse and, and just ongoing, terrible, terrible treatment. There is the exception of adultery, but even that is a question that we could explore further. But listen carefully to me. People who give up in a relationship never know what it's like to have the level of security and trust and relational bliss that is only for those who stay committed to one another for life versus those who enter into one relationship and when it gets tough, they give up and they move on and they have another relationship and it gets tough and they give up and, they, and they're, they're called serial daters. I don't know what it has to do with serial. No, that's serial with an S. Okay, so they, 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 they get together and they break up and get together and break up and get together and break up and what are they never, ever, ever, ever experiencing psychologically, emotionally, relationally? Where do they never go? They never go to the point where they bond at the deepest possible level where you know security and trust in ways that you never thought possible. So when God says, here are the parameters for sexuality, he's not trying to make life hard and miserable. He's saying, no, 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 listen to me, listen to me. 
faithful, committed love will pay dividends. There's nothing more beautiful, this couple <laughs> that I met not long ago, there's nothing more, this, this man, this woman, they have been married approximately forever. <laughs> These guys are so old, I have never seen in close proximity people this old before. These people informed me, this man and woman, that they had been married, married for 60 years, if you can even imagine that. And this brother is still holding her hand. And I'll tell you what, one of the most beautiful things you will ever witness is elderly people who are still head over heels in love with one another. And if you'll ask and you'll explore, you'll find out that they had some hard times. Most men are jerks and need to be educated by their wife in order to overcome some things that are embedded in malehood. And if she's patient, and if he is able to be taught, it's amazing the beauty that develops as they age together. Now, nobody has that outside of the parameters of God's law. When God says, this is my will for you, he's saying, it's so that it will go well for you. I, I want things to go really great for you. That's my goal for you. Look, this is one of my favorite verses on the law of God. Go to Psalm 119. This is, gonna, this is just going to take it to a whole new level. Look at Psalm 119. And wow, verse 32. Astounding. Don't forget this one. If you forget all the others that we've explored, don't miss Psalm 119 and verse 32. Look at this. Wow. This is, okay, I'm going to begin with the New King James Version, all right? Here's what it says in the New King James Version. David is contemplating God's law, and he says, I will run in the course of your commandments, for you have enlarged my heart. Do you like that language? I will run in the course of your commandments, because you have enlarged my heart. Let's just unpack that for a minute. Think this through carefully. If you're in a room that is 10 feet by 10 feet, or even 12 by 12, or even 14 by 14, can you run? No, you can't run, even if there's no furniture. Go against the back wall, and right over there is the next wall, 10 feet ahead, 12 feet ahead, 12 feet ahead. Just go ahead, just sprint. Boom you're going to hit the wall. You can't work up momentum. You can't get your legs moving underneath you. You can't run in a restricted area. You have to have space in which to run. Am I right? Yeah. So David says here, this is remarkable, he says, he says I will run in the course of your commandments. David perceives the commandments of God as a large horizon of freedom, not a restricted, small area to deal in. It's big, God's law. When God says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you know what he's doing? He's saying, if you always tell the truth and you deal with integrity, with everyone around you that will open them up relationally to you and your parameters for trust will expand. If you'll do business that way, Stephen Covey, the late Stephen Covey, who wrote one of the best-selling business books of all time, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of the seven habits is what he calls the win-win principle. He basically says, and I don't know if he knows, knows he's tapping into Scripture on this or not. I don't know what he was thinking. But he basically says, every single business deal that you conduct in life should be a win-win situation. A win for you, but you deliberately make sure the other person wins too. Don't ever take advantage of anybody. Don't ever cut a deal where there is a lack of integrity. And you know what he goes on to describe? Your business will boom. It will expand. People will want to do business with you because they know that you will not violate them relationally. They will know that you're the kind of person who has their best interests at heart. Isn't that amazing? 
So, so God's law is this huge, vast, expansive horizon of liberty that involves security and trust and fidelity and loyalty in relationships. You know how your life ends up restricted and small? By violating people. One after another, they will back up from you. And sin always incrementally leads to isolation. People pull back from people who violate them. And you do it as well. There's restriction in sin. There is freedom in God's love, in God's law. He says, I will run in the course of your commandments. And this is amazing. He says, for you shall enlarge my heart. Isn't that something? How many of you want to have a larger heart? I was in an airport recently, because I'm always recently in an airport. And while I was there, I saw a man speaking very disrespectfully to what appeared to have been his wife. Just right in public, being rude and mean to her. And then I noticed a little boy with his mom, and they were completely unrelated, but the little boy was just watching, and I'm over here on this side. So there's me, there's the mom and the little boy, and then there's this going on. And the little boy says to his mom, Mommy, I think he needs to get a bigger heart. What does it mean when God says that within his law he will enlarge our hearts? We began our time together in this particular message by pointing out that we cringe at pain and suffering and relational breakdown. But we also pointed out that if you continue doing those things that violate others, in order to justify self, we put up all kinds of psychological survival mechanisms to shield ourselves from our own guilt, and we become increasingly insensitive. Part of the new covenant, part of the writing of God's law in the deep interior of our hearts and minds is that it makes us sensitive again. The stony heart is replaced with a heart of flesh. We become sensitive again. Empathy begins to develop. We begin to feel what other people feel within God's law. I want you to imagine, in closing, a society, a city, maybe the size of St. Louis, in which every husband and wife are head over heels in love and enjoy one another's company. A city in which every parent-child relationship is one in which the parents and the children enjoy one another and never violate one another. A society in which nobody ever lies or steals or even wants anybody else's stuff. That's your stuff. Cool. I'm happy with my stuff. Perfectly content with my stuff. Don't want your stuff. Imagine a society like that and ask yourself the question, would I want to live there? And of course, anybody in their right mind would say, yeah, bring it on. But what the world doesn't realize is all we've just described is the law of God in action in a human society. Is it any wonder that the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul? It's a good law, and it's a law in which there is no harm. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you.